Here in the UK, we're blessed to have some amazing club fishing. There's loads of day ticket waters around the country, charging 10, 12 quid a day, but there's some absolute gems of fishing clubs dotted all around the country. And I'm here today at my local venue, Rushton Hall, and it is incredible. It's the, one of the most beautiful waters I've ever had the chance to fish. It's dirt cheap to, to join every year. And I wanted to show you that there's more to fishing than day ticket waters. They're fantastic, of course they are, but there's some club waters up and down this country that give them a real run for the money. So. Without further ado, let's get round to the swim. We'll have a look at this beautiful lake and we'll show you just how good the fishing is. So welcome to the beautiful Rushton Hall. I mean, look at it, what a stunning lake. I mean, you, it just looks like the best natural venue in the world. It's just beautiful. Lilies, mature woodland, just everything you could ever want from a fishing venue, just gorgeous. And it's available on the club ticket that costs you 60 quid a year. I think if you, you know, disabled or over 65, it's even cheaper. It's just amazing value for money. And let's be honest, there's loads of club waters up and down the country that give you that same value. And we did a, a video recently with Mick on the canal and a few of you said, why don't you do more stuff on club waters to show like the true value that there is out there on club venues. And I thought that's a great idea. So I've brought you along to my local club. It's uh, Desborough and Rothwell Angling. And it's just, it's just amazing, look at it. And I come here all the time. I bring the kids here, I come and practice. I mean, they do have matches, I haven't fished any of them yet, but it's just the perfect place to come and, and, and enjoy a bit of fishing. Now it's got an amazing stock of fish, a lot of carp in here, but it's not like commercial standards of stocking. It's really good fishing, like you could catch 100 pound in a match or when you're pleasure fishing, but it's not, not one of them places where they're gonna go absolutely ballistic. There's not thousands and thousands of carp in here, it's just a nice stocking but it's the perfect place to learn and, and, and hone your craft, if you like. And I think it's, like, I just wanted to point out how these places are. I mean, if it's 60 quid a year, you know, come 10 times, it's six quid every time you come. And I know people I know come here dozens of times in a year. It's incredible value. And people say fishing's an expensive hobby, and it can be. But if you find a good place like this, it's just, it's such good value for money and it's a great day out. So I just wanted to shine a light on a few club waters up and down the country. And I'm hoping that a few different clubs get in touch with us so we can go and film there too, because a lot of them are like hidden gems, if you like. This is a hidden gem. I lived 20 minutes away and I didn't even know it was here. And then this year, for whatever reason, I managed to find out about it. And, and, and just look at it, it's just stunning. So I just wanted to shine a light on a few different club waters over the next few months and hopefully encourage you maybe to have a look at that so rather than going to your day ticket venues all the time maybe look at joining a club so let's have a look at the fishing let's have a look at the bait we're gonna have a great day's fishing here or afternoons fishing and uh, yeah welcome to Rushton Hall let's have a look at the bait we've gone for today now this is a club water as I keep saying that means that it's kind of left its own devices a bit more than say a ultra managed commercial would be so there's a lot of little roach in here a lot of little skimmers there's some lovely silvers in here as well big skimmers and chub and stuff like that but there are a lot of little fish. And I think that's quite common when you come to club venues, you get lots of little fish and they can be a bit of a problem. And my bait kind of reflects that because we want to be catching the carp, we want to be catching the barbel, the bigger chub, the bigger skimmers. So my bait has to be quite small fish proof. So the first two ones are no surprise. And I've just got some eight mil hard pellets, just coppins, nice, big, chunky eight mil pellets. I'm going to use them on a short pole line, just where I can feed them by hand. And I've also got some six mils. Now I'm going to feed them on the long pole. I'm going to fish about 13 meters, up and down, hopefully, a bit of shallow, bit of fishing on the deck. And I'm just going to hopefully feed these six mils quite frugally. I may even swap to eight mils out there if the small fish become a problem, but both baits are hard, difficult for those small fish to, to, to eat. I'm not going to use like maggots and stuff on that long line. Uh, there's a chance I could catch some fish on the method. The method can be really good here. And I've got some nice micros that I've soaked the Mick Viles way, just in a little Tupperware, covered in with water. And then I've just sprinkled a tiny bit of ground bait on them, just to tacky them up a bit. And I've also, because I've got a bit of experience on this venue, I've got some ground bait as well. Nice, fine ground bait, really pongy and quite sticky as well. So that'd be perfect. I found here actually ground bait can outperform pellets on the method. But it's one of those venues where you've kind of got to chop and change. So I am covering my options a bit today. Hook bait wise for the method, I've got some of my old faithful pepperami. Wouldn't go fishing with the method without that. And I've got a few different uh, wafters and stuff. 
And then for the margins, I've got a little bit of uh, wetter ground bait mixed up. Uh, I like to mix it quite heavy. And then I've got some dead maggots I got out of the freezer. So pretty simple stuff. I've covered my options really with bait. Like I say, I'm gonna fish a few different lines. I'm gonna try and nick fish off different lines. So we've got a few different approaches there and we'll, we'll have a quick look at the rigs and the lines that I've chosen to fish now. So as I quickly mentioned in the bait section, my approach is gonna be a bit of a ducking and diving kind of day. It's that kind of place. Yeah, you can come here and catch loads of fish on the method, pellet waggler, you name it, you can do it all here. But I wanna cover my options a bit today and pick, and, you know, pick fish off. Now I'm gonna start on the method feeder, tie it across, and for that, pretty much a simple setup that I always use, 10 foot feeder rod. I've got a 30 gram small method feeder on there, in line. Um, I've got eight pound detection on the reel. And then I've got a little four inch or length, size 16, Camasan animal feeder. And then I've got a little bayonet on there. I can either put a wafter on there, but nine times out of 10, I've got pep around me on the end, to be honest with you. Now, what I've found here in the past is you've got to be as tight as you can to that island. So we'll show you that little process when we get fishing. But I'm going to start on that. And what I found on the method here in the, in the past, on the previous sessions is, you get really good runs of fish. So you'll go over there and you'll catch three or four fish quickly, then you'll have to build it again. And I think that is just says a lot about the type of lake this is. Um, it's not one of those places where you just catch one every chuck in. So it's gonna be quite interesting fishing. I'll show you a few little tricks that we've got up our sleeve to hopefully keep a few fish coming. Now on the pole, I've got three lines uh, sorted. Let me find my rig. Now the first one's sort of a 13 to 14 meter pinging line. Pretty standard stuff, really. Um, I've got the old green zip on there. They're, they're like two to eight pound carp in here, so that should handle them nicely. And then it's quite deep. It's actually 72 inches deep, which is quite deep by modern commercial sort of standards. But I've got gone for a 0.4 collet. It's flat calm today. Uh, and I expect to catch the odd fish as the bait's sort of falling through. Now, this has got a lovely, thick, long bristle, and I love that because I can leave plenty, plenty showing and really tell a difference between those liners. Like when you're pinging pellets all the time, you get a lot of false indications, a lot of little dibs and dabs. I want to be able to like tell the difference between what's, what's a, a liner and a, and a proper bite. And that long bristle really helps with that. I've gone for a point four, and then I've just got the same shot in that I seem to use every single time we go out these days. And it's just number eights, sort of staggered about two inches apart. It just works for me. Like I say, every time it just works for me. Then I've got, a relatively long hook length actually, like a 12 inch hook length. When I'm fishing in slightly deeper water, like I keep saying, on a hot day like this, I do anticipate catching a few on the drop. And I just believe that that longer hook length with no shot on it, just allows that pellet just to flutter through that last little bit. And oftentimes you catch them on the drop. It's just something that gives me confidence. And because I've got a heavy bait on the hook, I don't particularly need a dropper really close to my hook. Uh, it gives me a lot of confidence, that does. And I've just got a little size 16 hook on there and a bait band. Then for the short pole, step things up a little bit. It's actually pretty much the same depth as it is out on the long pole, but because I'm gonna use eight mil pellet short, I've gone for the raft float, which is a three mil hollow bristle, really visible. But I just find when you're fishing with a heavier bait, like an eight mil, that extra buoyancy just helps. I can fish it, half of it showing, and it'll just sit there and absolutely whack under when we catch one. I've stepped things up on the elastic front. I've got the blue zip. This might happen later in the session, and if, if it was a match, I'd want to get them out quickly, and I just want to get control of the fish, and I think the blue is better for that. Uh, relatively short line, not, not too short. Nice little block of back shots there. And I'm fishing it about two inches over depth. And then the shotting is just exactly the same as the last rig. I don't want to bore you to tears with my shotting, but like I said, that just works for me. Now, to complement them, I've got a couple of shallow rigs set up. One of them's got a little clunk on with a slightly longer line, 0.3. And then for slapping, that clunk is gonna be used for sort of flicking out past the pole tip. I do that quite a lot. Sometimes they don't respond to slapping. It can be a bit too much noise for fish on certain venues. I don't know how this is gonna to respond today. Um, so I like to give myself the option of a rig that I can slap over, over and over again and one where I can just plop it in. And the slapping rig is actually a big head float. So a four by 10 big head set that about 12 inches deep and I've got about two and a half foot above it. Just means I can slap it over and slap it over and not getting any tangles. Very, very simple stuff. The shot are right underneath the float. And I just find that, that with it being a slightly smaller float, sometimes that little slap is better than a big slap. So they're on my polys. Ah, it's not on my polys. So I've got a margin rig set up as well. How could I not fish the margins? Now, 
we've got this lovely board and like tins and stuff down this edge here. And then behind me, I've got a really nice sort of cutback. Now I'm not gonna fish paste, much to some of yours disappointment, but I'm gonna fish dead maggots down there. And I've got a four by 14 Fury set up, nice and strong, nice visible tip, and it's 30 inches deep. I've got 022 line, I've got the pink zip, and then I've just simply got a bulk, six inches from the hook. Nice strong hook length, size 12 hook, and I think when the time's right later in the session, we'll catch some fish down there. Like I say, I'm gonna pot in big pots of dead maggots, because I'm hoping that not only a few carp are down there, but we might even catch a barbel or two. You never know, it'd be nice. But I think we'll kick off on the method, and uh, yeah, let's go on it. Let's get some fish, fishing done, because I, I'm itching to get going, to be honest with you. So that's enough waffle, let's get some fishing done. I'm gonna start on the method, like I said, and there's a lovely little bay over there. Reed, it's ever so shallow, but I think that's gonna be perfect. And it's a tricky cast, but I'm sort of in between two trees and I'm gonna try and get it as tight as I can. I've already clipped up and I found here that the tighter you can get that feeder to that grass, the quicker you get bites. I'm gonna start off on that little bit of punched meat. Now on the pole, I'm not gonna feed anything like with a big pot or anything. I'm literally just, as I've cast out with this, I'm gonna throw a few eight mils short and I'm gonna catapult a few six mils long. Um, no need to big pot at the moment. I'll probably big pot the margin, but we're not ready for that yet. That'll come in a little bit. But the reason is these old lakes like this, they're full of silt. And if I was to big pot, a big pot full of six mils out there on the long pole, yes, I'd get some fish in there but I'd also get a load of fizzing and a load of silt bubbles coming up, which can make catching them really difficult. I mean, they can be quite tricky to catch long on the bottom anyway, but as soon as you in introduce too much bait, it could be a nightmare. So I'm gonna be really cautious with the feed on that long pole. Short pole, I can probably be a bit more aggressive because it does feel very firm there, but I'm still only gonna trickle in pellets. So what I've done with, I've got started off on the method with ground bait wrapped around it, and that piece of meat. And then we're gonna try and get that feeder. Nice. Nice and tight to that far bank. It's quite a, it's quite a nice little shelf actually. And as I mentioned before, or in the sort of intro to this, a lot of your bites come, actually as you're sinking your line here. So once we get it going, I wouldn't be surprised if most of my bites come as I cast in, hit the clip, I put my rod tip underneath the water straight away and then I'm, I'm ready. I've got to get that line under the water, get it sunk. There we go. You see, and two V's come together on the surface, and we're set and we're ready. Now, let's start feeding that long pole. And all I'm going to do is trickle in two six mil pellets at a time. That's all we need to do. Last thing we want to do is, like I say, create a massive load of bait on the bottom, get in indication straight away. So that's a good sign. And then I'm just going to do the same short. I'm going to feed two, six, two eight mils, sorry, short. I've just picked a marker ever so slightly to my right, just to get it out of the way of me playing fish. And I'm just going to regularly just throw two pellets in. And then on a long pole, I'm just going to do it every minute, 30 seconds, just ping two pellets. I've picked a marker. I've got a little shadow that I can aim into, which makes it nice and easy. But all we're going to do is just keep trickling those pellets in. And, and like I said, that pinging is, is so so effective because you're getting a lot of impact for, for not a lot, a lot of bang for your buck if you like. You're getting that rattle of the pellets going in, which is very attractive, but there's not actually loads of build up of bait on the bottom, so you can still catch them. Now I'm getting indications, and you may remember in the bait section, I mentioned that what happens here is you chuck in and you tipple, you get a lot of indications for the first 30 seconds to a minute, and then it all kind of stops. And I, I can only assume that's a small fish getting, getting your bait off your feeder. So that's in as long as I've, I like to leave it really. If anything, 30 seconds is all you need to be leaving it in on this venue. You just, I don't know for why, they just seem to be on your feeder really quickly here. And I'm actually double skinning the feeder as well. So I'm putting a full load up and then I'm gonna put a second full one on as well. I just think it's warm now, it's summer. We want to be getting through a bit of bait. So we'll get that on there. It wasn't the best cast actually, the first one. We'll get our eye in. That's better. Yeah, that's better. 
nice and tight. And they were just sort of, you know, repeating the process really. And it's, you know, people seem to, with the method feeder, think you can just chuck it out and leave it. And there are places where you can do that, of course, but when you're fishing in shallow water and you've got all these little fish in here, you've got to think about how long your bait's actually lasting. Because at the end of the day, if all your bait's gone from around your feeder, you're just basically ledgering with a little tiny piece of meat over there. So, I want to keep refreshing that feeder. And of course, chucking it in regularly, they come to the noise of the feeder going in, that bait going in, and it hopefully it'll get stronger and stronger. Now, I always fish, I've mentioned this in other videos, but I think it's really important. I always fish quite slack to me on the tip. I don't like to have loads of tension in. I think when you're fishing up against islands, that's the best way, personally. I think when you've got your rod bent round, every time you get a line, your feeder's a bit of too much tension and your feeder can move. I think it's important to fish with a relatively slack line. We've got a low stretch mono on, so you'll see the bite. It's not a problem on that front. And the fish hooks themselves anyway against the feeder. I don't believe they hook themselves against the rod, so I think it's not, not the end of the world. There we go. Couple of casts. Get out of there. There's some pads just off to the right of where I'm fishing. And uh, <laughs> it can get a bit airy for the first few seconds of the fight here. There we go, we're off, off and running. Brilliant. So I've just got a 10 foot rod. You could use a nine footer here to be fair, because it's, it's not the longest cast in the world, but oh, I just love using this rod. So, <laughs> so I'm just gonna use it. I feel like a massive fish actually. It's definitely a carp though. There's some real like, they're almost like wild fish in here. Like long lean commons and they go mental. This one's a bit more of a little ploddy mirror, I think. Nice fish though. And a great one to get us up and running. Look at that. This little beauty. That is immaculate. Just gonna slip that hook out of him. Look at this for a little gorgeous little fish. Look at that. Absolutely immaculate. Loads of little scales on there. Immaculate. It just shows you you don't. <laughs> out the land that you don't have to go to commercials all the time if you want to get your carp fishing fix. You know, more and more clubs are stocking carp now as well as the traditional species. Now to put my meat on I just use a bayonet. Pepper army is incredibly tough. Now I just use a, a little punch, punch a little bit, bit out and then pop it on the bayonet and then I just trim it with my teeth. I quite like pepper army so every time I put a hook bait on I get a little Pep around me burst, it's quite nice. I'm looking for a bit around like a six mil pellet sort of size. I think that matches the, the feeder size quite nicely. It sits in, in between the bars of the feeder quite nicely. So that was good. That was a quick bite. 30, 40 seconds, something like that. Great start. Let's get back out there. We're getting our iron now. It's a lovely chuck over there. Probably 25, 27 meters, something like that. Sometimes when you get them going here on the method, you see the tails coming out as they're fe feeding over your feeder, which doesn't seem to happen these days so much. So it's nice when it does. And I found when you think you're casting tight enough here, if you take another six inches off, off your clip and go even tighter, and you sometimes catch even more. It really can be like important to get super tight to that island. Again, it's an, another small point that um, I've made over and over again in various videos on the Newfish channel and on my own channel is about matching your catapult up with your distance. Now we're fishing sort of 13 meters on the pole with six mil pellets on a flat calm day. If I was to use a really thick, heavy catapult, Chances are my pellets would be just going a bit too far. They'd be naturally wanting to go for about 14, 15 meters. So I think use the smaller catapults when you're in this situation and you're trying to group them tight at a short distance, you need to match your catapult up with that. So I've got a nice soft little catapult that just pings those six mils lovely to that distance. Just perfect. And 
I, I used to be one of those who just used one catty for everything, like a big thick one. But I've definitely learned that, you know, accuracy is so important. And I think, why wouldn't you just use a nice little delicate catty that makes the job easier? Now this is actually, oh, I, might, I said then I was gonna just take a touch a bit line off. Just take a foot off. Just see if we can get even tighter in them reeds, because I'm sure there's fish there. Like I say, I've had it so many times here, you think you're casting really tight to the island and then you just move even tighter. Interestingly, those two casts then were with micros as opposed to ground bait and we didn't get a response. So I'm not sure what it is, but they do seem to like ground bait here. I mean, they do everywhere, don't they? Oh yeah, that's a bear cast. If that's not hung up on a reed, that's, that was beautiful. Could be hung up on a reed though, that. That is hung up on a reed. <clears throat> so we just have to tweak that to get that distance perfect. Over there, and it's a lovely little spot that is because it's in a bit of shade. There's loads of fish on the pole looking at this. <clears throat> I say I'm kind of learning along with you here because I've not fished a pole here before. Oh, am I in there? <laughs> like I might be in the tree. I think I took that one a bit too, too left. I'm in though. Oh, are we? I can see a reed moving. There we go, we're in. I maybe just took a little bit too much off and ended up in the reed. So I, uh, I've just tweaked it again. I just took another little bit off, gained a bit of line back and, I, and that cast just went in. From my viewpoint, it looked, looked perfect. So obviously it always looks closer for me than what it maybe actually is. But I'll just keep tweaking that. I want it so that when it goes in, it's like clipping the <laughs> clipping the grass. Get the grass wet every time you chuck it in. But there's so much activity on the pole already after just a little bit of loose feeding, so. I've got to be honest, I'm itching to get on the pole already. I did this last time, didn't I? When we went to Rookery. <laughs> Promised a great session on the feeder and ended up on the pole very quick. But they're, they're swirling and my pellets and everything, man. I can't watch this. Can't watch this any longer. We're going on the pole. Sorry to interrupt the video, but if you're a part of a club or you run a club and you fancy putting your venue forward for us to come and film at, then get it in the comments below because we are looking for new places to film. If you've got somewhere like this that's absolutely stunning, a bit of a hidden gem, or you just want to promote your club, get in the comments below and let us know because we are on the search for new venues to film at because we're bored of going to the same old places all the time. So get them comments in about your local club water and hopefully we can check it out. Okay, so that was a quick start on the method, but I can't sit and watch these carp cruising about any longer, so I'm gonna go on that long pole. <clears throat> now, interestingly, as often is the case, as I've done that, the fish have gone down. So we're gonna start off on the bottom and see if we can work at it. And I'm just gonna put a, just a six mil straight out of the feed on the band. And then we'll show you how we're gonna work it, because we're actually gonna work the rig a little bit. The way I've got it shotted, the way I've got that long off length on, it allows me to sort of flick it out past the pole tip, flick it to the side, and watch the float come in. And often you get the bike on the drop, or just as the, you know, the pellet hits the bottom. So I'm quite active with this. Because I'm loose feeding, I like to flick my rig out to the side, almost like you used to do when you were you know, maggot fishing and stuff like that. Very effective with our pellets. Lifting and dropping is very effective, and I often, every time I feed, I'll lift my float out and sort of lay it on the surface and instigate bites. I think you, you've got bait falling through the swim and I'm just trying to mimic that with the loose feed as well. 
but you've got to be careful as well with the loose feet. It's very, oh, there we go. Got, see that though, it's just as it settled, just nicely settled and then it went under. Perfect. Um, it's very, very easy to break my rod. <laughs> it's very, very easy to get carried away with loose feeding. You've got to be disciplined, get, keep those two pellets going in. As soon as you start feeding too much, the bait, the fish will either come off the bottom or you'll get them fizzing up on the bottom and you can't catch them. So we're just trying to be quite disciplined. And rather than forcing the fish up shallow by aggressively feeding, I'm kind of just waiting for it to happen with the same feed pattern, if that makes sense. If they want to come up shallow when I'm feeding two pellets, then I'll take advantage of it. But if they don't, I can still catch them on the bottom because I haven't ruined my swim by levering pellets everywhere. Which, trust me, me being me, I want to lever pellets everywhere. But that's not the get. If you're fishing like this on the bottom, it's not the answer. You're not going to get anywhere with that. You're just going to foul up loads of fish. God, this one's scrapping well. Oh, nice fish. Yeah, we're not trying to force them up shallow. We're just trying to, if they come up shallow with the same feed pattern, then I can be happy and just take advantage of it. Nice fish. Lovely common. Oh, he's the second fish of the session and he's absolutely immaculate again. Top lip, perfect or cold. Look at him. Absolute Bobby Dazzler, look at that. Gorgeous fish. Slipping back. Four or five pound, I should say. Five pound, maybe. Off he goes. That worked well, didn't it? So we caught that one just as it, just as that pellet sort of hit the bottom. It was in there for a few seconds and then wallop, it went under. And that is so typical with this sort of style of fishing. Pinging, as everyone calls it. Very, very, very effective and simple. But all them cruisers have gone now, which often is the case when you get the pole out there. Have a habit of buggering off. Mustn't forget about our other lines, but I think, I just don't think it's going to be a feed a day looking at this. The fact that we've caught them straight away on the pole like that. Might just be too still. Just ping those pellets in. Now they went. Devers are slightly past, but I'll just sit and wait. I can easily feed again in a minute, but like I say, you've just got to be careful. You've got to be quite disciplined. If you're going to try and catch them on the bottom, just need to. You know, the temptation is to be just get your cat in your hand and keep feeding them, but it can just lead to foul lookers. And we are going to foul look fish. It's just the nature of the beast, unfortunately, when you're fishing like this. It's quite deep out there. We're loose feeding. You do foul like an odd one. Unfortunately, it's just an you know, unfortunate part of the game. But So that's been, I think, on the bottom long enough. So what we're going to do, pick up two more pellets and we're going to try and get them nicely around the pole. And then as they hit the water, I sort of lift the float up and just lay it on the surface like that. And it just sort of, just, I can just imagine that hook bait sort of fluttering back down the last couple of foot of water. It might just catch one's eye. So they've heard the noise of the pellets going in and then all of a sudden my pellets fluttering through again. Just sometimes just instigates a bite. And I'll do that pretty much every time we feed. They do dig the bottom out. So I'm conscious of, of that. So I will regularly put the plummet on and go out and check the depth again just to make sure. Because your swim will get a little bit deeper. You'll get a little, little crater in your swim where the fish have obviously been rooting around and feeding on the bottom. Sometimes you can just sit and sit and sit and wait, but I tend to find when it's fizzing, that's not the answer. Maybe if you was fishing a big bait like paste, if it was like fizzing like mad, like a jacuzzi, I'd be tempted to put a big blob of paste on or two worms or something like a big visual bait that can work really well when they're fizzing like mad, but we haven't got to that point yet. so. We are, we will catch them on this. Just got to be a bit patient. Just 
love the pellets, don't they? As soon as the noise, you get them little indications on your float. <clears throat> a bit of a flick. I'm going to flick it out past the pole tip this time. I don't know if you can see that, how I did that, I sort of lifted the pole really high and swung the hook bait bit towards me and then sort of flick it out like a pendulum. And get the rig nice and past the pole tip. Sometimes the fish naturally back off the way from the pole and you can just pick them off. It doesn't always work, but just another little trick to have up your sleeve. I've had matches at Makings on Lake Four, which is a real deep lake. You can be 10 foot deep and you flick it out, fish 16 metres with hard pellets in the winter and you just flick it out past your pole tip and you just get it, it just gets to the bottom of the fall of the rig and you catch them. Really good fishing when that happens. That is funny, isn't it? We went out there, we got some indication straight away and then like they've gone again. Hey, look, what's this? Not a car. Little skimmer. Nice little fish though. Not what we're after on the old hard pellets, but as I was doing that, there was an odd carp milling around, so I'm getting half tempted to stick the shallow rig on, but I think we'll, we'll go back out on the bottom because I don't think they're quite ready for that yet, but I must admit there was enough of a sign then to maybe get me reaching for the shallow rig. I'm just gonna have a slow bait up just just to delay me uh, decision making here. Yeah, I think I'm going to put the shallow rig on, aren't I? Because there's one there cruising about. Is that the right move, Joseph? Or is it better to go back on the bottom? Going back on the bottom. Which will mean that as soon as I get out there, there'll be cruisers everywhere. Because that's how fishing works, isn't it? <laughs> as soon as you go on the bottom, they're everywhere. In fact, there's one there. And then as soon as you put the shallow rig on, they all vanish. Because that's how fishing works. Little indication. It's funny though, it's kind of like should proves my point a little bit about the um, not needing a, a dropper shot so close because those little skimmers like that, they're, they're so delicate feeders and yet we saw the bite no problem even with that long hook length and I think because we're using the bait with some weight to it that you get an indication, there we go, look at that, you feel it bang its head, you get an indication when the bait's taken so it's not as paramount to have a dropper like it would be if you were using maybe expanders or maggots or smaller baits like that, where you've got a light hook bait on. He didn't seem to want to do much and then get him in close and off he goes. So, for once, I've got my decision making right then by going back out on the bottom. Because I could have easily gone out shallow and not caught anything. But I decided to go with my gut and go back on the bottom and we got one, which is nice. That's the beauty of this style of fishing. You've got, you've got the option to, oh, I jumped out of the landing there. You've got the option of going up and down. And it's such a, you know, pinging such a good way of fishing on lots of different venues where carp's concerned. It's just a nice way to do it. Another sprightly Rushton common. Now, I'm going to crack on with this for a little bit, and then hopefully, next time you see me, we're catching a load of fish shallow because I don't think it's going to be long looking at 
how many fish are coming through at different spells. So I'm gonna crack on with this and we'll see you again soon, hopefully doing a bit of slapping. Okay, so when I left you last time, there was fish cruising everywhere. We just caught a couple on the bottom and it looked all set up for a lovely little bit of shallow fishing. And off camera I thought, let's just have a 20 minutes or so slapping and swinging rigs at them and stuff. And they just, I just couldn't catch them. I had a couple of chances where I felt like I should have caught a fish, like the fish has turned on the bait and I've just missed it. But they haven't come shallow at all, um, which is really interesting. In fact, like if you look now, there's no fish cruising or anything, but there's still fish on, signs of fish on the bottom and we're catching quite nice and steady actually on the bottom. And I think that's such a great point, whether you're fishing a venue like this or a commercial or whatever. Just because it, well, there's one there actually, but just because it is like this and it's hot and sunny, doesn't actually mean you're always gonna catch shallow. And it's why you do need deck rigs up as well as shallow, because if I was coming here on a hot day, I'd be thinking carp, slapping, I'm gonna catch a load of fish shallow. And if I had just turned up with shallow rigs, I might not have had as good a day as what I've had. And because I've covered my options, both up and down, I've managed to keep loads of fish coming, but fishing on the bottom. And it's really cool fishing, like just nice and steady, taking what's, you know, taking what comes, and uh, rather than just blathering bait everywhere, it's really interesting. Maybe if you'd have fished casters or something like that, you maybe have had a better response shallow, but they haven't wanted to come up. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure why. Maybe it is because there's no wind on the water or, or whatever, but. But the fishing's been great, it's just fish every sort of five or six minutes on this. Just keep lifting and dropping, keep laying the rig back in, working hard for every bite basically. <coughs> but it's now two o'clock, so I'm thinking of feeding the margins and we've obviously been chickling those eight mils in as well, which will give us that next stage. We'll feed the margins, we'll have a little look short, see if we can catch some fish on that and then hopefully have a nice big finish down the edge, but it's open just to catch one more on this, just to show you. There we go, look at that little indication. You wouldn't even believe that, would you? It's a little, little, little dink, a little fast sharp dink, and, and we're in. Look at, I mean, look at them bubbles. They're just, the bottom just erupted. But that's only happening when, we, when the fish are flanking. It's not happening when we're feeding which says to me that we're, we're not getting a, a, a big build-up of bait on the bottom. If we were, the swim would just be fizzing like that and it'd be very difficult to catch one. Whereas, because we're feeding it light, we're giving ourselves the best chance of uh, still catching them on the bottom. And that's a nice one to end this little bit of long pole fishing. Lovely fish again. Great fishing this is really enjoyable. Come on me old. I've got that green zip on, I tell you, but blue wouldn't look out of place. <laughs> Even on a long pole. But when I get this one in, I'm gonna go on that short pole, but I am gonna feed the margins now because I think the sun's gone down a little bit. We're getting to that time of day now where the margins are going to start playing a part. Oh, that's a cracking fish. But I just wanted to just quickly wrap this little section up by just sort of saying, you know, don't always put your eggs in that shallow fishing basket because I might have had a disappointing few hours fishing if I'd have just gone all out shallow today. But because we've covered our options, we've managed to keep beauties like that coming, I mean look at that, what a cracking fish, absolutely immaculate. So we'll get on that 8mm pellet line, but more importantly we'll get the margins fed. Okay so I'm going to feed the margins, now I'm going to give them a half a pot of dead maggots and then I'm just going to give them a bit of a covering of ground bait as well and I think that'll just be a nice amount just to get that margin kicked off. I really want to feed almost pure dead maggots if I can. But I've just got my little tape marker on my section and I'm just gonna accurately roll that in. 
and I think that's going to be great. Now I'm only going to feed one side to, to begin with. In fact, fish had just spooked. I'd just sight seen an odd sign of fish coming in. And I think that that's going to be the perfect little way. I'm going to give that sort of 20 minutes down there. But firstly, let's give them eight mil pellets a try because we've been feeding it all day and I'm itching to give it a try. Right, so let's give the eight mil pellet swim a try. So we just literally got one out of the feed again. Really simple stuff. But this time we've got that raft float and I'm hopefully, oh my God, just seen one, bow wave out the margins already on that bait. So I think we're going for a bonanza when we go down that edge. That's a great sign. Anyway, forget that for a minute. <laughs> we're on this eight mil pellet. And uh, I'm just flicking it out. You've got to imagine the, the slope's like going away from me like that. And I kind of want my pellet to just rest up against that slope if I can. So I always flick it out past the pole tip and let it come underneath my pole like that, almost like a pendulum back towards me. That means that wherever that pellet rests up on the bottom, it's going to be nice and tight. So as soon as a fish picks that bait up, I'm going to know about it. Now, no point complicating things. We'll stick with that sort of two pellets. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to do it twice. Not like that, I'm not, because that was terrible. I'm going to do it twice. Better. And I don't know why, sometimes when you feed twice, it's almost like they hear the first lot come in and then they actually see the second lot and follow it down. So I'm hoping that that's the case, but I think the, um, it's really warm actually today and still, and I think it's quite deep still here. I may have been better off picking this spot and trying to find like four foot of water maybe. That might have been a better choice, but we'll see. I've maybe made a mistake because I've not given myself enough of a difference between my long pole line and the short pole line in terms of depth, it's very similar. In hindsight, I think if I was coming back, I'd plumb this one up further up the slope to get out of that full depth. But you know, these are the things you learn, isn't it, when you come to venues that are new to you. I kind of felt like that was a nice distance to fish, but it might just be that it's still a bit too deep. We'll see. We've been feeding it all day, just trickling those pellets in, so I can't imagine it'll take too long. If there's any fish about, we should we should find find out pretty quick. But the fact that they've come into that bait in the edge so quickly in that shallow water, which is 30 inches deep, suggests to me that the fish might be more comfortable in the margins. And sometimes it's you know, you go to some venues and five metres is better than the margins or the margins is better than five metres and sometimes you've got to feed both and pick off and kind of work out which one's the best, kind of be the best for you on the day. Just see another swirl there now over the bait that I've just put it in, so. I'm gonna give this just a couple more, there's a bubble though next to me float. So there's fish down there, but I think this is too deep. I think I've made a mistake here by feeding this in too deep a water. And I could quickly move it and replumb up and start in four foot, but I think I'd be better off spending that time in the edge, to be honest with you. That is part of the learning process, isn't it? Sometimes you don't get these decisions right. Like last time when I when we went to Rookery, I found a lovely flat spot in the edge where it was a bit deeper and it was perfect for the F1s but it wasn't right for the carp and it might just be that that depth there maybe I've come on it too late maybe if I'd have gone on this depth a bit earlier I might have caught a few on it all part of the learning process because it is about depths a lot of the time we've carp, you know, they, they only feed where they're comfortable. <clears throat> no, I don't like that at all. We're going down the edge because that isn't right. Today, on another day, it might have been. But, because I want to do things legit and proper, I'm going to go down the edge. So, I'll let the cameraman readjust and hopefully we'll catch a load of fish down that edge. As I said, I wasn't happy with that eight mil line. I felt like I was just wasting my time, to be honest with you. And I think it's just a, one of them things. It's a bright, hot day. 
And I think the fish are more comfortable in shallower water. And I fed that little bit of dead maggots and, and ground bait and there was fish on it immediately. First time I pointed it in. And I obviously gave it five minutes looking for the fish on the eight mil line and I quickly gave up on that. And I just dropped in, let the cameraman get his camera set up and it's gone immediately down the edge. And I think that's a big lesson. Now, that's a great start, that one. Not a massive fish, but a nice one. And I think that's a great lesson. Fish will only feed where they're comfortable. And uh, obviously, at this time of day, they want to be in the margins. Now, one thing I've done since this morning, when I showed you the rigs, is I've put my paste pot on as a kinder pot because I'm gonna feed large potfuls of dead maggots. Now, I mentioned in the um, early part of this video about the small fish problems, and I've obviously experienced it here before where you get large amounts of roach and stuff in your swim. Now, obviously feeding maggots, I know roach don't seem to go for dead maggots as much as they do live ones, but it could still be a problem. So I'm trying to really be aggressive and that means feeding a lot of bait. So I'm actually filling that full of ma maggots every single time. So it's a serious amount of maggots. Almost the same kind of amount that I'd feed with the big pot. And I think that that's a great way to catch them in the edge. We all know sometimes you, your big pot, and then by the time you've come back, put some bait on and gone back down there, the fish have snapped up and gone. So I'm almost recreating the big pot scenario with this large pot. So accurately roll them out there. And we'll put that over the top, but that didn't take long at all to catch that first fish. I've just put about 10 maggots on that hook, say size 12. Let's see if we can have like a, an amazing finish now down this edge, because it looks good. It looks good for a, a flurry. There's, as I hook that one then, a few more come out of the swim. So I think we're going to have a nice little end to this session, which is just brilliant. It's been really enjoyable. That long pole has been really interesting, like how they won't come up. And then obviously we've tried that short line, it went right. And even the method was a little bit tricky. We caught a few on it and we caught a few when we weren't filming and stuff, but it wasn't easy. But it's still great fishing. There's fish down there now, I think. I haven't got any worms or anything like that with me, but it is, it is worth sometimes bringing a little handful of dendrobeaners because when you're obviously feeding a lot of dead maggots like this, having a big standout bait, either a big bunch of maggots or even two worms can be really effective. But I didn't actually get any from the shop. I just, <laughs> I just went down the maggot route. I'm just trying to be nice and patient really because not like they're tailing up or anything. I think we've just got to put that dollop of maggots in and wait for maybe one or two fish to come along the bank and find it. And I didn't put any more ground bait in, but obviously I've got to keep that in mind that maybe they want some ground bait. So maybe next, next time we ship out, we'll, we'll put a little bit of ground bait in. Sometimes the fish need that smell of the ground bait in the water just to maybe it's the cloud that it gives off or something but sometimes I need that ground bait just to encourage them to come in but we'll give this a little bit longer before feeding again it's been difficult I just I don't know if you noticed that I just put some ground bait in as well like I said sometimes they do need that the extra encouragement and the traction that the ground bait offers. And obviously sometimes the combination of the dead maggots and the ground bait works really well together, so let's just see. See if that brings another one in. I've, there we go, look at that. Now straight away, as soon as we put that ground bait in. That is sometimes the way, sometimes they do need that ground bait. We've got the pink on, which shows him who's boss. 
I'm, I haven't fed the other side of me, the left hand side. It looked great down that left hand side, I've got to say. It's the same depth, so I could, I could do it. But I think sometimes, especially when you're only fishing for odd fish like this, where it's not, you know, it's not like we're getting them crawling up the bank or anything. I think sometimes you're better off concentrating on just one side and waiting for the fish to come in rather than, you know, I could be down the right, the left hand side when the fish are in there and vice versa. And you can end up in a bit of a muddle sometimes. I'll leave that without baiting, and if I do something wrong here and it looks like it's not going to happen, then we could maybe look at that side, but for now, I'm happy just fishing one side. That's a nice little mirror. And it came to that ground bait really quick, so let's repeat that process. Like I said, it's a big old pole pot I've got on there, but it's kind of, like I say, recreating the big pot effect. And we're in almost in September now as we film this. The fish are in eating mode and they're coming to the margins to eat and I'm prepared to feed them so I don't mind having a big pot on the pole. Lovely big bunch of maggots. Dollop of dead ones. Just cover that pot. Get back in that is my paste pot. That I use, or one of the face pots. See if I come back to that ground bait. As quickly as that, because that was an instant response. There's always a way. I think today, obviously that long pole was such a banker, we was catching loads of fish on that. And then, uh, as I mentioned, I think with the eight mils, I needed to feed that in a slightly different depth. Probably should have thought about that a bit when I plumbed them up, when they were both the same or very similar depth. Probably should have thought about that a bit more, but there you go, that's what we're, we're here to learn. Oh, cool, look at that. That just, that was textbook, that was. I've got a little wiggle on the float. It's a little, tiny little wiggle. No signs before that, and it just just shows you, doesn't it? That one obviously was obviously just coming along the bank. And I'd say we're feeding it really nicely actually because we've not fouled up any or we're not getting any missed bites. We're just okay, that's three lovely bites that we've had. Which after getting things wrong on that short pole line, I feel like it's nice to have got something right today. <laughs> I've got the 18 plus zip on now and it's my favourite margin elastic. I'm still going to have to use the puller on these but these beauties. Just looking down there, there's like there's no signs of fish down there, there's no swirls, there's no nothing. And then all of a sudden it thumps under and you've got a hard fighting carp on. Lovely fishing. Fish, aren't they? But this one feels like a much better one. Oh, here we go, finally. That's the biggest fish of the day, that is, and that is a proper edge munter. Look at that. I wonder if he's pulling my arm off. Don't think it'd be £10, but he won't be far away. Certainly £8. Have a little look at him. Very, very nice fish, that. Lovely, like wild looking common. And that is the difference the edge makes. Look at that. Beautiful. Slipping back. It's not looking that, it's not looking that ideal, this.
Come on, Pablo. One issue with fishing down a point like this, they can get round the back. <laughs> get out. Oh, I need to re return to my pew. Crisis averted. <laughs> well, despite that little near pole breaking collision that we just had, the fishing is ridiculously good now. Just shows you, doesn't it? Time of day, getting tactics right, being in the right place when they're actually feeding. And it's just, we've had fish up to sort of double figures and it's just brilliant. Great fishing. And I'd say we've got the margin tactics spot on. That little dollop of maggots and then capping it off with ground bait just seems to be perfect and I was just saying to the cameraman that I've only missed one bite down there which says we've got things right. We're putting the bait in, little short weight and then it wallops under with a Another carp on, and it's just fantastic fishing. And I thought just before we go, I'll just recap the what we're feeding, and then you can see it hopefully in real time how it's performing. Well, that's another cracking common, large amount of my commons in here, it seems. Not even the, not even very big, but he gave a great account of himself, that's for sure. Scorger. There you go. Certainly four pounds, but thought much harder. So we'll readdress the cameras and we'll quickly show you how we're loading the pot up. Catch one more and then we'll uh, leave you to your dinner. Okay, so I just want to catch you one more. Like I say, it's been fantastic down this edge. I just wanted to just quickly just show you what we were doing in terms of feeding because I think it's been cock on because like I say I feel like everyone that's coming in I'm pretty much catching it can't see them or anything but I'm not getting any liners or anything it just sits there I get a little wiggle and it wallops under and I'm just putting on big big bunch of maggots like that so it's a nice standout up bait they can just obviously just slurp that up and I mentioned before about the size of the pot I think that's obviously really important because I'm almost recreating that big pot effect because as we know when you're big pot baiting the fish often rush in clean up and then by the time you get your rigging position they've already munched up and what I'm doing I'm putting a big old dollop of maggots in just dead maggots like that and then just capping the pot off with a, a bit of ground bait not low just enough like that and that is what I'm feeding every single time I go in setting that big dollop of trap like a big trap and then just sit accurately putting my 4x14 rig over the top and it is working absolute treat so let's catch us one more I'll finish this video nicely and what I'm trying to do pop the bait in and then I lift that bulk out and I drop that bulk right on top of where the bait's gone in and lower it in really slowly I don't want to flick it out because I run the risk of laying it over one's back or something like that. Last thing I want to do is foul up one. I'm trying to keep it so I'm trying to pick it up, lower it right on top of that bait, and then once I'm happy that it's in position over the top of the over the top of the bait like it is there, I'll just sit there until it goes under. But it's just uh, I just wanted to just quickly touch on the venue while we wait for the next wallop under. Just what a what a beautiful fish you're in. You know I didn't even know this place existed up until early part of this year there we go and then and now I come here all the time and it's just fantastic and I'm sure there's loads of these places maybe even on your doorstep where you can have great fishing maybe not as good as this because this is a special venue but you know really good club fishing it might be you've got a lake that's got some great roach in it or bream or tench or whatever it's certainly worth checking out your local fishing clubs because there's some great venues to be had and hopefully off the back of this, a few clubs will come forward and maybe suggest some, some venues for us to go and film at because we're always looking for new places to go. It's always a, nice going to new places, shining a light on these 
hidden gems like this one. That's the perfect one to end on really because it's just phenomenal fishing now. Look at that. Yeah. Oh, terrible netting. <laughs> terrible bit of netting. So many commons. They're obviously a, like a stamp of older fish that are commons, but that one's been a bit, a bit of a longer video this time. But a few of you asked for longer videos, so that's what we're doing. And hopefully you enjoyed it. I know I've certainly enjoyed the fishing, and that's a cracking one to finish on. So, if you did enjoy it, don't forget to like and subscribe. And we'll see you again on the next new fish video.